This week on Political Capital, looking for a grand bargain in the deficit. Is there a deal that both Republicans and Democrats can embrace? Our guest on the show, Republican Senator from Wisconsin, Ron Johnson. And on the last word, disappointing second quarter fundraising for Republican presidential candidates. We begin the show with Wisconsin freshman Republican Senator Ron Johnson, a major Tea Party supporter. Thank you for being with us, Senator. Well, Al, thanks for having me on. Unemployment rate went up to 9.2% on Friday morning, anemic uh, job growth, uh, uh, obviously bad news for the economy. There are those that say, however, that that shows what a sluggish economy it is, and as, as important as it is to cut back on spending and cut back on the size of government, that any kind of tight fiscal policy now would be a big mistake and we ought to delay for at least a couple of years in order to get this economy back on track. Well, I, th I think the problem is really is the uncertainty caused by all the government spending and the fact that we're, we've, in just the last three years, we've increased our debt and deficit by over $4 trillion. That's a 35% increase in our nation's debt since President Obama. And you don't think if we cut now it could lead to a double dip recession? The, the problem is we're borrowing. We're, 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 we, it's not that we have the money to actually spend. We have to first put in the structural caps. We'll increase the debt ceiling upon certification that we've actually passed a constitutional amendment that will limit spending and eventually lead to a balanced budget and let the people decide. Let, let the American ask, people decide. Let me ask you this. The, you're, we're three and a half weeks away from what the Treasury Secretary says would be a cataclysmic default. Do you think that, what are the odds now that we'll hit August 2 without any kind of deal? Well, they're higher than they should be because this president did not engage until just last week, basically. I mean, to me, it's, it is unbelievable. Do you think now, there'll be a default? Well, first of all, there's no reason for a default. Right. I mean, according to the president's own budget, if we don't increase the debt ceiling, we'll have to live within our means, which would be $2.6 trillion next year. Now, $2.6 trillion, just to put that in comparison, 10 years ago, we spent $1.8 trillion. It totally covers all the interest on the debt, which is $256 billion. Right. It covers 100% of Social Security, which is $760 billion. That's a trillion dollars. That leaves $1.6 trillion cover about $2.6 trillion of expenditures. Well, you've actually so, put so, out... No, there's, there's no reason for us to default. And you have talked about a default budget, you know, if we hit yeah, that. Yeah, budget. Right, right. right. Let me ask you this. Would it cover Chinese bondholders? Anybody who owns, okay. you know, American so debt. So cover Chinese the, the holds, Would it cover military pay and benefits? Yes, it should. All military pay and it benefits. It should. Right. Would it cover drone attacks on the Taliban? I, I haven't laid out the debt ceiling. No, no, I, have, I haven't are, laid out the debt ceiling. These are important and questions, I, and, I'm, and I'm not recommending it. What, what I'm what I'm saying what, I, what I'm saying is, it's in, you know, I'm new here to town. I know how broken Washington is, and I issued a letter to the or I sent a letter to President Obama saying it's irresponsible. I understand that you're not advocating. I really do. I'm just saying, if okay. we hit that situation, you talk about a, a a sort of a contingency budget thing, what it would cover and what it sure. might not cover. Uh, would well, it here, cover those drone attacks? Th th in, this, on the this, Taliban? This, you know, I'm a business guy. I've I've had customers go bankrupt. Right. You know, we're basically you know dealing with an almost bankrupt America, so I take a look at. This is secured creditors versus unsecured creditors. So I put interest on the debt, you know, the debt right. service. I put Social Security. I put paying the soldiers, and you know, specify some other things. That would be the secured creditors. IRS they, they, refunds. They, they would they would get dollar for dollar coverage, and then you take the 1.6 versus the 2.6, right. and this is one way of handling it. Say, so we'll we'll pay the rest of you, 60 cents on the dollar until we reorganize, until we actually fix the problem. Right. Okay. That would be one way of approaching so, the problem. So, but IRS refunds might only be 60% or Wisconsin farm payments might only be 60%? For, for, for a couple weeks until we actually fix the problem. Okay. If Obama agrees to a $4 trillion plus reduction over the next 10 years that includes three out of every four of those dollars are on the spending side, significant cutbacks uh, in Medicare in addition to uh, uh, domestic spending, and $1 trillion in added revenues. Could you support but, that if the components are right? The devil's in the detail. Okay. And here, but, and here, but, and what I'm trying to ask, you wouldn't rule that out automatically because of revenues? Depends on the detail. Again, I, I'm a small business guy. I never right. came to Washington for special tax deals. I'm opposed to those special tax deals, but not opposed to legitimate business deductions. Senator Johnson, am I right in saying what you wouldn't rule out, if the details were right, a package that included significant added revenues, if it, done, if it was done correctly? If, again, we need more revenue, but we do need to increase revenue the old-fashioned way by growing our yeah, economy. But, you know, we, we, we listen, listen, we can't. Economic growth is the number one component for a solution here. None of the policies that we enact should harm economic growth. Increasing taxes 
harm in economic, okay, economic growth. Why, thing. why would we do that? That would be silly. 1993, similar economy. Bill Clinton increased taxes. 2001, it was, went, it was not a similar, it, it was not, not even close to a similar economy. We were economy. coming out of it. It, not was, even it was the close. economy wasn't even right. Close. All right, let me, 1993, Bill Clinton increased taxes. 2001, George W. Bush, massive tax cut. We created 23 million jobs, or 23 million jobs were created under the Clinton administration, three million under Bush. If taxes are all important, why that difference? In 2003, total revenue of the federal government was $1.8 trillion. No, but give me the five, jobs. Five, five years later, in 2008, it was $2.5 trillion. Had we taken Bill Clinton's budget at $1.8 trillion yeah. in 2000, grown it by the rate of population and inflation, we would be at about $2.6 trillion right now. The problem is spending. Senator, it's out I of want control to ask spending. You again, why were so many more jobs created after the Clinton tax increase than after the Bush tax cut? Because, because jobs and businesses were created in the 80s under Ronald Reagan when he dropped tax rates down to 28%. No, I'm a living proof of that. I began my business. So all those Clinton jobs are due to Ronald Reagan? Absolutely. That is, those, those came from the businesses that started in the 80s when Reagan dropped top marginal tax rates from 70% down to 28%. Yes. It's all due to Republican policy. Nothing to do with Bill Clinton's policy. You, you don't right? realize that. Absolutely. No, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly you know that. what caused it. You want to have a balanced budget. We mentioned that earlier. Shrined in the Constitution. Yes. You're a big booster of uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, Congressman Paul Ryan's budget. Ten years from now, he would have a deficit under his budget of about $400 billion. What would you cut? What big programs would you cut to well, get there that Paul Ryan doesn't? What, what we need to do is structural reform the entitlement programs. And as I, you know, I'm new to this political process, but as I went through the campaigning, I would ask younger people, and for me, unfortunately, that's 15 and under, what, what do you expect to get out of Social Security and Medicare? But Without then, exception, the answer was always nothing. So what that tells me is there is a receptive audience for structural reform. It's not fair that people currently paying in the system expect no benefits. So you would go further than Paul Ryan not, on, on, on Medicare? Listen. Paul Ryan, what I support about Paul is he's, he's acknowledging the fact that Medicare is the biggest problem we've to got, and we, budget, we have got to start to structural reform To get to that, that balanced budget, you would go further on Medicare cuts, right? No, we have to restructure the program. Okay, but that's, that's cuts. We have, I mean, we, restructuring sounds great, but that's cuts. It may be desirable, but it's cuts. It's not necessarily to individuals. Okay? You, could you, be to doctors. Could be to hospitals. You've accused Barack Obama of demagoguing. Uh, and yet members of your party still peddle this notion that Obamacare sanctions death panels. And you wrote a column a few months ago that said the single greatest assault on freedom in my lifetime, more than communism or terrorism, was the Obama health care plan. Isn't that the kind of demagoguery you accuse Obama? No, because that's exactly what we're talking about. When, when government is going to decide what kind of care you can have, where you can get your care. And that is what we're... This you is what think it, that's a bigger threat than communism? That, that's exactly what this thing is leading. You do? I, I wasn't threatened under communism. I'm saying in my you life... You threatened under terrorism? Listen, I'm, I'm talking about things that are imposed on me by this, by our government in America. It is the greatest single threat, threat to my freedom, okay. our freedom. We appreciate very much you being with us today. Thank you. Enjoyed we look it. forward to further discussions. And when we come back, more talks Sunday. Are the budget negotiations about to cut a deal? Bloomberg reporters are next. Welcome back. Dismal job numbers add to the president's challenges as he tries to negotiate a deficit deal. Bloomberg News Congressional Correspondent Julie Davis and White House Correspondent Juliana Goldman join me now. Juliana, unemployment rate at 9.2% last month, anemic jobs, bad news for this White House. Yeah, Warren Buffett on Bloomberg TV, Al, saying that the president would not be wanting to have the election right now. This is bad news for the White House, no matter how they spin it. And you already saw some of that spin heading into the Friday jobs report. David Pluff at our Bloomberg Breakfast saying that voters are not going to vote based on economic indicators, so essentially downplaying the significance of the unemployment rate. But the unemployment rate shakes confidence, and numbers don't lie. We're going to be saying this over and over again for right. the next 16 months, but since World War II, no president has won re-election with an unemployment rate above 6 percent, the exception Ronald Reagan, 7.2 percent in 1984. An economist surveyed by Bloomberg put the unemployment rate at 8.2 percent in the third quarter. Did you cover that Reagan, you cover <laughs> that Reagan campaign? I'm, I'm a, I, you were minus one. I know the Bloomberg terminal. Out. Let me ask you this, though. When it comes to the budget negotiations, how does this jobless report affect? Well, what it does, it puts pressure on both sides right now to not mess around with the debt ceiling and to get a deal done heading into August 2nd. But in terms of a grand bargain, you know, while the calendar now, as we tick closer to the beginning of August, might argue against a grand bargain, 
this jobs report actually might for, might uh, might help a grand bargain because what that could do is it could ensure some sort of stimulative measure in the short term, but in, ensure that there are fundamental changes over the next 10 years over or so term. for significant deficit Julie, reduction. do you see more flexibility in, in Congress? On There's deal? definitely more flexibility in Congress, no question. In the last week, we've seen uh, Democrats come off their position a little bit on entitlement changes. Republicans come off their position a bit on tax cuts uh, or tax increases um, being able to be considered as part of this deal. I do think that the jobs report, at least in the short term, is going to sort of throw everyone back into their corners ideologically where Republicans are going to say, you see, we absolutely cannot raise taxes because it's going to cost jobs. Right. And Democrats saying at a time like this, when people are feeling all this pain and joblessness, this is not a time to cut spending or certainly to cut programs that people depend on like Medicare and, and Social And there already Security. are existing schisms in both parties. Absolutely. I mean, we heard there was some talk this week of President Obama and some congressional Democrats being open to um, some changes in Social Security, which would basically th slow the growth of the program through changes in the way that, ca that inflation is calculated and factored in. And privately, Democrats went crazy on their leaders um, this week in Congress and said, listen, we cannot cut a deal that's going to cut Social Security benefits at a time like this. If we make any changes to that program, it has to be the savings have to be plowed back in. And on the Republican side, um, there seems to be some glimmer of flexibility on including revenues as part of this deal if they could get some sort of longer term agreement to do tax reform, which they've been wanting for a long time. But there are some Republicans who say, you know what, this is not the time to do that. We need to focus on the debt and spending cuts. Revenue should not be a part of this mix. So if you're going to get a grand bargain, they both have to suffer. There has to be pain on both sides. You're not going to get real entitlement cutbacks without more revenues. You're not going to get tax increases without doing something about Medicare. Fair? Absolutely. And, and President Obama said that at the White House. And, and John Boehner told Republicans, rank-and-file Republicans, the Speaker, told them in a meeting this week that, listen, it's going to be pretty apparent pretty soon whether this is going to be able to go forward and, or whether you know we're just not going to it's going to collapse under the partisan burden of, Why of doing Boehner this. Why does Boehner want a big deal with the problems he has in his caucus? Well, he want he needs a big deal in part because of the problems he has in his and caucus. He's not going to get all the Republicans to vote for raising the debt ceiling. There are Tea Party supported people, there are conservative Republicans, fiscal conservatives, who just won't do it. And a lot of people who campaigned and won election to Congress saying, "I'll never raise the debt ceiling." Plus, he has Michelle Bachman, presidential candidate, say, basically basing no her way, campaign no around that. Right. So he's going to need Democrats. So the only way you get Democrats if, is if you have something in the deal that they want. And the only way that you get something they want is if if Republicans give up some Juliana, of their do you, Does Obama think this is a winning issue for him next year? Yeah, because even if the president tries and fails for a grand bargain, a four to four point five trillion dollar deficit reduction uh, deal, he's the White House still thinks that he comes out looking like the leader on this. The Republicans have really carried the torch on deficit reduction, which Americans see as one of the real issues standing in the way of a strong economic recovery. So the White House thinks that either that, that the president would be able to neutralize that argument or to be able to carry tor the torch. The problem for the president is that he needs to be able to carry the torch on jobs. Okay, let me ask you both. On the spot, just quick answer. There's three possibilities. No deal, a grand bargain, or a small ball deal that gets us through the election. The most likely. Grand bargain. I agree, grand bargain. Grand bargain. Boy, you two think big. We're so I, optimistic. I'm a, I'm a small ball person, but that's why you guys are you and I'm me. Uh, let's go to a couple political questions. Juliana, you mentioned David Pluff earlier. He also at that breakfast took a big shot at Mitt Romney, didn't he? That, is that because they think Romney's going to be their opponent? Yeah, a big shot and completely unsolicited. Right. Just. Um, yeah, it, I think what it shows is... Called him a contortionist and a, said he was back and forth, yeah, forth on the economy. I think it was a first-class political contortionist. Yeah. Look, Mitt Romney is the Republican frontrunner right now. He's also the most credible Republican presidential candidate voice on the economy. And so the White House sees that, and they know that they need to start eating into that credibility. Really, the Romney camp really didn't mind it, did they? I mean, it, among other things, it tended to over shadow a rather mediocre fundraising uh, quarter. Well, absolutely. I mean, they, Mitt Romney is trying, even though there's a pretty crowded Republican field right now, to run a general election campaign. Every chance he gets, he says, if Barack Obama wants to debate me on this issue, be it health care, the economy, or anything else, let's have that debate. And, that, and he put his communications director put out a statement right after uh, Pluff made those remarks saying, hey, uh, if, if 
he wants to have a debate on the economy, Mitt Romney will be happy to do it any time face to face. And that allows him to rise above the fray and not have to worry about his Republican presidential rivals and just focus on Barack Obama. That, that's where he wants to be He right also now. said if he were president, he would fire David Plouffe. Uh, I, don't, I, I think it's safe to say all the Republican candidates would do that. Well, yeah, in that same statement, they pointed out the comments that David Plouffe had made on the unemployment rate, but not the shot that he took at, at Romney in right, that statement. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you, your grand bargainers, and it's grand to have you with us today. And when we come back, the view from Islamabad and the case against Dominique Strauss-Kahn fumbles. The last word is right after this. I want to commend Cy Vance for doing what I think took uh, some great uh, courage and personal integrity. Welcome back. We'll go to Margaret Carlson and Kato Byrne in just a moment. But first, President Obama announced his troop withdrawal plans from Afghanistan last month. Bloomberg News South Asia government reporter Jim Rupert joins me now from Islamabad. Jim, uh, the U.S. is trying to get the Taliban to truce talks. Are they going anywhere? Uh, well, the process, of course, is closed, but there's some very visible obstacles, Al. Uh, for one, the Taliban spokesman in Afghanistan rejected these talks this past week. Uh, and all the smart thinkers we talked to, including former Taliban officials in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, say that uh, they don't see a big incentive for the Taliban to make concessions in this because the Taliban know perfectly well the American timeline to wind up a combat role. And in addition, the Taliban leadership, you know, it's been a decade since they were uh, thrown out of power, and that's quite a lot, a lot of time for new leadership to be rising, uh, new divides within the movement. So not clear how solid an interlocutor we can uh, see the Americans find at this point. The U.S. also wants the PACs to go after the Haqqani network, the most lethal Taliban uh, element. Uh, is Pakistan accommodating? That seems deeply uncertain. Uh, the, uh, the Pakistani army has, uh, has conducted a little operation on, kind of on the fringes of the Haqqani territory uh, this week. Uh, but the Haqqani network is, is one of the oldest kind of proxy clients of the Pakistani military. This is a relationship dating back to the 1980s. And, uh, and basically Pakistanis say to me, look, you want to negotiate with the Mullah Omar Taliban at the same time you're asking us to fight with the Haqqani Taliban. Uh, that, that doesn't seem very much in our interest. We're going to make enemies right here on our borders. Uh, um, it's going to be at our expense. Jim, to further complicate the situation, Admiral uh, Mike Mullen, the head of Joint Chiefs of Staff, this week said the Pakistani government sanctioned the killing uh, of a journalist who had written negative reports about the infiltration of Islamic militants into the ISI. Isn't that bound to, to just worsen an already bad relationship? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the, um, whatever, whatever the impetus, look, in, in American uh, political culture to want to speak up on this, uh, the, uh, uh, I was speaking just uh, this, uh, this morning to a, uh, a, a Pakistani friend who monitors the military here, and, and he said the only way this will be perceived uh, by, the, uh, by the Pakistani military is that it's, it's a deliberate attempt to further poison the relationship. Uh, uh, for what reason, you know, it, it's difficult to imagine, but th this is the way it would be seen from the Pakistani side. Yeah, of course, one of the reasons may be because they actually did it. But uh, Jim Rupert, thank you very much. Uh, be safe, and we'll be back to you uh, in subsequent weeks. Let me turn to Margaret and Kate now. Let's go from the very serious over there to the bazaar here. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the case of the aggravated assault, alleged assault on a New York uh, uh, hotel maids about to be dropped. Do we owe the Manhattan, or does the Manhattan District Attorney, and do we owe the French and Strauss-Kahn an apology? Kate? Oh, I hope not, Al. <laughs> I don't think, uh, I don't think they'll be getting a, uh, excuse moi, uh, even though yeah. there was a clear rush to judgment on the part of the DA, uh, I think, uh, it, it, be, it became uh, even even a bigger deal because of New York's practice of the perp walk, the high-profile perp right. walk. But immediately, European elite opinion just didn't respond to the media circus, which I think is abusive to an accused rights. They seemed to think it was really not fitting that a mere chambermaid should be able to lodge such accusations right. against her better. And that, of course, I think had the American public with the right reaction, that a wrong somebody should be able to go against That's what makes it so a big sad if it is a, a flawed nobody. case because right. there are a lot of, yeah. you know, it's yes. a yeah. and we are We are far superior to the European elite, as Kate points out. Uh, but I I've would, always thought that. I would defend um, the district attorney. 
mm. uh, listening to a mere chambermaid uh, who had bruises and there was considerable forensic evidence that something happened in that room uh, that was not consensual. Uh, and when he got information as the, as the investigation proceeded that was in favor of the defense, he turned it over. Unlike some prosecutors, look at the Duke Lacrosse case where the prosecutor doubled down. This was fairly fast in turning it over and letting, uh, and, and, and DSK is now out uh, on his own. We'll rarely find a prosecutor as bad as a Duke Lacrosse uh, prosecutor. Let me turn to politics, Kate. Uh, Mitt Romney led the Republicans in fundraising, $18 million in the quarter, but you know something? That was almost $10 million less than Hillary and Barack raised four years ago. I know. It's much slower. And I think, you know, the, the old saw is that Republicans don't need to fall in love to fall in line, but apparently their wallets do. Kate, Newt Gingrich, a uh, million dollars in debt. Tim Pawlenty only raised four million. Yeah. Gingrich, a goner, Pawlenty on life support? Well, Newt Gingrich doesn't really need to be raising too much money. He doesn't have a staff to pay, Al. That's true. So That's he's going to be able to do this very <laughs> inexpensively. Um, look, this field is shaping up much later than it did four years ago. It might not be complete yet. Yeah. And, of course, during this quarter, Haley Barber and Mitch Daniels were both possible candidates. That right. would have kept a lot of people on the sidelines. But I think it's safe to bet that whoever the Republican nominee is, they're going to be vastly outspent uh, by an incumbent, President Obama. Okay. Cato Byrne and Margaret Carlson, thank you. And we are superior to the French elite. No question thank of you, that. Thank you, Al. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. This is Political Capital from Bloomberg Television.